Weighing in with soybeans and a baby show straight out of Norbert, Missouri, we have Soybean Festival. From Hayward, Wisconsin, at 73 years young with the world's largest muskie statue, put it together for Muskie Fest. Finally, packing a punch with fire dancing and a pet costume contest, the Roseau, Minnesota Fall Harvest Fest. One of these festivals could win $100,000 in the Cenex Hometown Throwdown. You decide. Cast your vote at CenexHometownThrowdown.com. Cenex, powered locally. I'm David Plotz, the CEO of CityCast. Many of you don't know this, but the show you're listening to right now is part of a larger network of daily local podcasts that we make here at CityCast. We have 13 teams around the country on the ground making newsletters and podcasts that connect people to their cities, including here in my own hometown of Washington, D.C., Go CityCast DC. I listen to all of our shows, and I am always hearing local stories that could affect all of us around the country one day, or they're just so interesting that I feel compelled to tell my friends about them. So today, for July 4th weekend, we're going to try an experiment. All of our hosts have joined me on one giant Zoom call. Hi. 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 And they've joined me <laughs> to tell me the story from their hometown that you absolutely need to hear about this year. The story that could have consequences for your city in the next year, from the Tesla tunnels fiasco in Vegas to the end of cash bail in Chicago, from Salt Lake City's unbelievably grandiose Olympic schemes to Portland's failed experiment to decriminalize drugs. I'm David Plotz, and in this very special July 4th weekend episode of CityCast, here is what the entire country is talking about. So let's head out on our whirlwind tour of the United States of America. And we're going to start in Chicago with our CityCast Chicago host, Jacoby Cochran. Hi, Jacoby. What is happening in Chicago today that the rest of us need to hear about? What's up, David, and all the other hosts across the CityCast network? I'm excited to talk to y'all today about Chicago and Illinois' end of cash bail. Uh, while Chicago and Illinois' criminal legal system has been an easy target for anti-Black misinformation, no measure has been as fiercely discredited in recent years as our state safety act, signed into law over three years ago on the strength, might I add, of support from Chicago area organizers and representatives. It called for a broad set of reforms, among them the first state in the country to eliminate cash bail. A quick cash bail one-on-one for folks. Under the cash bail system, just Judges set a dollar amount a person would have to pay to avoid being jailed for weeks, months, or even years while waiting for trial. This system drives up the number of black, brown, and low-income folks who are incarcerated pre-trial. And it's critical to note people who are jailed before trial for even a few days or weeks because they cannot afford to pay bail risk losing their jobs their housing, having their families destabilized, uh, and are much more likely to either be convicted or pressured into plea deals. This is something I personally saw the brunt of while teaching storytelling inside of Cook County Jail, Illinois' largest county jail, which is located on the lower west side of our city. Uh, court challenges slowed the Safety Act's implementation for two years. Now, after nine months since enacted, we are observing shrinking jail populations in counties across the state. No radical increase in post-release crimes, as the misinformation would have you believe, and more detailed ruling from judges in detainment decisions. Uh, while it's still early to draw sweeping conclusions, proponents are pushing for more investment to help individuals navigate the pretrial criminal legal system. And this model, while being lampooned in cities across America and probably in many of y'all cities, I believe in time we will see more cities and states adopt the measure as we continue to reimagine our public safety strategy, both locally and nationally. So, Jacoby, quick question about that. So in a lot of places where cash bail or the end of cash bail is considered, it becomes part of the we're weakening public safety conversation. And people are like, oh, you, you get rid of cash bail and they're all dangerous people on the streets. And this is all part of the Democrats plan to make cities unsafe. How does that play out in Chicago? Is it is there a political implication in Chicago, I guess? I mean, it was a major political battle throughout the years long battle to get this considered at the legislative level and then the push to to actually uh, get it signed by the governor. And then again, implementation uh, was slow for two years because of challenges in the court system in more conservative counties in which that rhetoric and that narrative has carried throughout. But 
I would argue that our public safety strategy as constituted is not necessarily serving us up uh, this world. We believe the end of cash bail will bring forth. And by all practical measures, murders are down across the nation. Violent crimes are down across the nation. Shootings are down across the nation. The, The world by, you know, the data is getting safer and ending cash bail is less about you know, handcuffing uh, police uh, and law enforcement and more about sort of rooting out the inequities of our system that make black, brown and low income folks bear the brunt um, of our of our criminal justice system. So I like the idea of cities and states uh, being labs for public policy experimentation. And we have some really great, interesting examples of that in some of our other city cast cities. Not all of them have been as promising as what Jacoby is describing with bail. And Claudia Meza, you and the CityCast Portland team have been watching Oregon try and and so far fail to figure out a roadmap for decriminalizing various drugs, right? That's true. Yeah. About four years ago, Oregon voters overwhelmingly, including myself, approved ballot measure 110, uh, making us the first state in the U.S. to decriminalize possession of small amounts of all drugs, But it was also supposed to expand addiction services and social supports uh, through the marijuana tax money that was coming through and and all of the law enforcement savings that we were going to have because they weren't arresting petty drug crimes, which sounded amazing on paper. But the addiction services, David, never showed up and neither did the social supports. So we also weren't saving much on law enforcement. And pretty soon, open air fentanyl markets were springing up downtown and people suffering from addiction became very visible. So you have this like very visible fentanyl crisis and then it's coupled with our housing and homelessness crisis that's affecting most major West Coast cities. And you kind of end up with a bunch of people frustrated with what appears to be like neglect on all levels. And so people were doing hard drugs out in like open parks. Kids were having to dodge drug paraphernalia on their way to school. At one point, Portland saw 200 opioid overdoses in five days, which sounds like Fox talking points, but this was just the reality of the situation. But I do want to call out, and this was the the most embarrassing part, is it wasn't all of Portland. It was mostly concentrated in our downtown and central east side neighborhoods, which is where most tourists stay. So that's where the most that the majority of our hotels are located. Terrible optics. And that helped spread the narrative of our like downfall nationally. Uh, so this April, uh, Oregon Governor Tina Kotek signed a bill that recriminalized drug possession, walking back major tenets of Measure 110. And there were some outside national interests in play that I can go into, but I don't want to I don't want to take up all the time. But yeah, there, there was a lot going on behind the scenes. Has anything changed since the recriminalization has happened? Does it look different? Not really. I mean, supposedly we've also banned outdoor camping. And, you know, I just feel like the services need to step in. I mean, really, David, what happened was outside interests came through, tried to change the city's infrastructure, didn't have local involvement. Law enforcement didn't have any kind of buy-in. And so they had this issue. They couldn't navigate being like the conduits of I'm supposed to take you to services that don't exist. The best thing that happened out of this is that people were like, oh, so what didn't work out was this. This new law that is supposed to walk back Measure 110 is more forceful in in creating the infrastructure that wasn't there before. So hopefully, maybe, if we ever try that again, (laughs) it'll actually work out. We'll see. Let's talk about a totally different kind of it. It's not really an experiment, but it's an example of a city doing something that at least I had never heard of. So we've all heard of there being Chinatowns. Many cities across the U.S. have Chinatowns. But Trinanuri in Philadelphia, Philly is going to have an Africa town, which is something, of course it should have an Africa town. How did it come to be what's happening there? Yeah, so Philly is a city of neighborhoods, and we are so proud of our neighborhoods. But the African Cultural Alliance of North America is trying to add another one in Southwest Philly. And this is a neighborhood, according to their polling, that has 74% of residents that are immigrants from Africa or the Caribbean. In fact, the recent data by the Pew Research Center shows that 
Philly's population of black immigrants grew by 121 percent between 2000 and 2019. And the founder says that Philadelphia has been a very welcoming city other than many other cities. I'm sorry, y'all. Um, and that's where they found their niche. So as a part of this Africa Town vision, organizers have done things like launching Africa Town Restaurant Week last year, which spotlights a dozen African restaurants to help people get, you know, more familiar with African cuisine. They've done some fundraising. And what is really notable is that they have a goal of creating an African center. And this is going to be a $23 million community center, restaurant, health clinic, daycare, and office space. And construction is expected to start soon. So I'm really excited. I really loved watching this project unfold. And I would love to see more cities, especially those with big immigrant populations like ours, look for opportunities to celebrate more cultures in permanent ways like this and develop Africa towns of their own. Do you and your neighbors, do you hear people talking about Africa town? Or has it become a term that people use yet? Because that's when you know it's made it. Right. I think we need more awareness, you know, and I think um, we'll get there similar to Center City, uh, Brewery Town, Fish Town. We'll, we'll get there. But yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Let's go across the state to another experiment that has gone kind of in the, a weird direction. What has happened to the self-driving cars of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Megan Harris? Yeah, I just think the way this has shaken out is not at all what our city and county leaders expected it to do. So just a few years ago, we had tech companies flooding into town. And Pittsburgh has this reputation as nurturing a lot of our tech community anyway. Um, we like to think of ourselves as sort of a Midwestern Appalachian Silicon Valley. But we had as many, I think, as six companies with permits to test in our city. Three or four of those were rolling around the exact same neighborhood all at the same time. They even got state law changed to be able to test these cars in different places with different levels of accessibility. So literally no one in the car, it's driving itself. And there was this message that abounded that if self-driving could prove itself in Pittsburgh, that it could do it anywhere. I actually got to see it even in a past life because I briefly worked for one of these companies um, in their comms department. But even for regular people, it was like such a nice idea, more access for people with different abilities, not having to have that awkward conversation with like an older relative, for example, about when to maybe put the car keys down. But it just didn't work out that way. Instead of figuring out this technology, Pittsburgh itself turned out to be like impossible to plan for. So it was our hilly topography, our up and down climate, our weird triangular traffic patterns. Um, we have a neighborhood literally called the Golden Triangle. And then this just constantly evolving problem of construction. It just flummoxed developers, uh, so much so that most of them have either quit, like completely, like the companies are gone, or they've moved out of town, which for me now begs this question of if self-driving can't work in Pittsburgh, will it actually work anywhere else? Didn't you say, Megan, and not to put you on the spot here, Raheel, that Houston is now where they're testing? They're testing still in other parts of the country where they have more consistent climates, for example. But yeah, I'm curious to see how this shakes out specifically for our neighbors down there in Texas, um, because one of the companies still headquartered in Pittsburgh just started testing autonomous routes with 18 wheelers on I-45 between Houston and Dallas. So, you know, Godspeed, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's going to be our problem now down in Texas. And they are actually resuming self-driving cars here in Houston. But there's going to be a driver there for the, for the first few weeks. And then we'll see if it can resume to just the robots. Yeah, they tried it in Austin and it did not go well at all. There, it was, there was like at one point during the city, there was something, I think it was like 40 car pile up where they all were in the same place at the same time. <laughs> like pile up like they crashed? Yeah, they crashed into each other, but in this weird like circle. They're all the <laughs> they're all just bunched up and they couldn't back up. It was amazing. It's like a mating ritual. Yeah, one mm -hmm. of one of the Pittsburgh companies may or may not have been operating at Austin as well. So might have been us. I don't know. All right. So speaking of transit experiments gone awry in funny ways, let's go to Las Vegas, where Elon Musk and the boring company have the Tesla tunnels. David Figler and Sarah Lohman. What is what is that mess, the Tesla tunnels? What is it and why is it amusing? 
Yeah, so why is it amusing? Cute maybe you all, but what a mess here. So billionaire Elon Musk started The Boring Company in 2016, and the goal was to drill tunnels for his Teslas in cities across the country that he said was going to fix soul-crushing traffic. So our city and county officials signed on, and the project started in 2019 as The Loop, which connects the different halls of the Las Vegas Convention Center. Personally, I've been on the loop and it is so slow. Four people have to get in and out of a single car, which is so inefficient compared to a train or a bus. And Musk promised driverless vehicles and speeds of 150 miles per hour. But so far, there are drivers driving 40 miles per hour. And the Boring Company does seem to value speed over safety, uh, especially during construction. And now OSHA has cited them for violations. David, do you want to talk about the toxic sludge? No, Sarah, I don't want to talk about the toxic sludge. (laughs) Uh, Um, But then again, neither do most of our local public safety officials uh, in Las Vegas. So it's a mix of chemicals, dirt and groundwater coming up, basically mining byproduct. And when sludge hits skin, according to OSHA, there are significant burns. So uh, eyebrows got raised when Boring started dumping some kind of wet dirt next to a busy outdoor shopping complex without proper permits. Uh, A lot of questions remain. Why is it being put there? Where else is it? Is it dangerous? Uh, Same goes for wastewater that they're uh, getting into the storm drains. So all of this is to say, if this is a test case for other cities, which it does seem to be, officials from all your all towns are coming here to look and see how it works, we should have concerns about how little info is coming out, the insufficient environmental impact studies, also the weirdness of officials being way more cheerleader than watchdog. How big are the tunnels? Is it like just one loop or it's like miles upon miles upon miles of tunnel? Currently, it's just one loop that also connects to the monorail and to one casino. Um, But he has been buying and looking into other land to expand the tunnels throughout the city. Anything that connects to a monorail is intrinsically seems doomed. Our poor monorail. We love it. so. We're a Living Simpsons episode every week. This is Bridget in D.C. When I was in Vegas for a CityCast meetup, I took the Hyperloop. It was so, I was very underwhelmed. I thought it was going to be this space age thing. Quite the opposite. Yeah. I'm totally indifferent to it. You know, I mean, we had an expert on our CityCast Las Vegas podcast. He called it a white elephant, you know, a a useless gift. The tunnels, they aren't big enough to be repurposed for actual rail lines or anything else. Honestly, at this point, it's a novelty. It's underground single file taxi service with man Teslas that still only go a few miles after years of work. Uh, It's just so how it's weird how people are talking about it. It drives me crazy crazy. It's space age like Space Mountain was in the 1980s. And our politicians keep saying that they support this because it's public transportation for our city that's basically free. We don't have to pay for it, even though there's about $52 million of public funds that were already kicked in by our local convention authority. And it's not public transportation. It's highly privatized. I can't see Musk offering discounted rates for students and seniors. So you just heard from Bridget Todd, who's the host here in Washington, one of our co-hosts in Washington. And Bridget and I, because we both live in D.C., were affected by this next thing that she's going to talk about every day, which is D.C. a couple of years ago voted to abolish the tipped minimum wage, which now requires restaurants eventually to pay a full minimum wage to all employees. And it is just it is mayhem. It is so confusing to eat out at a restaurant these days. Right, Bridget? It is so confusing. So Folks in D.C. overwhelmingly voted to gradually phase out the tip minimum wage for restaurant staff by 2027. And David, can you guess who has not been real happy about this turn of events? I mean, every diners, people who work (laughs) at restaurants, people who own restaurants, people who uh, have been to a restaurant. It's not even restaurants. Like sometimes you'll go to a non-restaurant and it'll happen. It's so confusing. It is so confusing. So now, you know, you go out for a nice meal. You're feeling good. You're full. You're having a good time. You get the bill. You open it and you're like, what is this surprise service charge that I don't know anything about? I don't know what it is. So now all of these surprising and sometimes completely inscrutable fees have started showing up when you get your bill. I've seen them called service charges. I've even seen them called like wellness charges or 
fair wage fees, which is my least favorite. There could be anywhere from an 8 to 20% charge on the top of your bill that sometimes the restaurant will say is decidedly not the tip. So are you meant to tip on top of that service charge? If the service charge is not a tip, what exactly is it? Like, where exactly does it go? It's confusing. It's it's crazy making, not to mention awkward, right? So like, what's a diner to do? Now, the law says that these fees are meant to be prominently disclosed to diners with language describing exactly how the fee is used, who it goes to. But this does not always happen. And it's created so much tension between everybody, servers, restaurant owners, and diners. D.C. has really become kind of a test case for phasing out the tip minimum wage. And as more and more states are thinking about doing the same, I think that this kind of chaos and confusion when you go out to eat could be coming to your state, too. If states don't take initiatives to, like, create clear, comprehensive guidelines for how it can be rolled out and then enforce them when they are not followed in that way, I think that this kind of chaos is the kind of thing that, like, People, it will keep people from going out to eat. It will keep people from going out for the restaurants. This is Jacoby in Chicago. And last October, we passed uh, here in Chicago to end our sub minimum wage. And on July 1st, it went up by 8%. Uh, it won't reach the actual minimum wage until 2028. But the Illinois Restaurants Association is the loudest opponent uh, and is the reason that it went from getting phased out over three years to five. And we are starting to see those service charges pick up, but I think it will only get worse as the years get on, uh, go on. But the restaurant industry is the largest employer for Chicagoans age 16 to 24. Uh, so it's a it's a big deal in our city as well. In a way, this phase in, I feel like, Bridget, is the problem itself, which is that had they just jumped it, it would have been very awful and terrible for restaurants if they had just jumped it at one moment. But because they're phasing it in over several years, people are just so unsure about what's going on. And it's not even clear what the workers are getting or what they're not getting. And if it had just gone from one state to the other state, it would have been a terrible month or two. But then everyone would have been like, OK, this is the new normal. But it's this in-betweenness is awful. Yeah, I mean, I'm no expert, but I completely agree. And I think the awkwardness and tension, it, I mean, if you've gone out to dinner in D.C. recently, you have felt it where you have to call the server over and you're like, what is this charge? Is it your tip? It's awkward for you. It's awkward for the server. And it's like this oscillation between feeling guilt, like not wanting to look like a pinch penny who's not going to tip, but also not wanting to feel like you're getting taken for a ride by a restaurant. So another theme we have seen at CityCast recently is is cities making big bets on their marquee industries, on some signature industry. Sometimes that's working, sometimes maybe it's not. And I want to start with Ali Vallarta in Salt Lake, where sports and outdoor living are central to the city's identity. And Ali, if I am reading this right, you guys are proposing to be the permanent host now of the Winter Olympics. Is that right? <laughs> Kind of, David. So Salt Lake is almost certainly hosting the 2034 Winter Olympics. The announcement is going to be made this July during the Summer Olympics in Paris. Full disclosure, my opinion is that this is not good for our city, but I lost. All you other cities might be surprised to hear that because I do think like nationally and even globally, the Olympics, we all agree they're fun to watch, but very few cities want them in their backyard the thing about Salt Lake is that 2002 still echoes in our imagination. The games were profitable, which is kind of unheard of. It also gave rise to Mitt Romney as a national figure. You're welcome. Um, and the big case for 2034 is that we already have the infrastructure. Now, the problem is that the IOC says that because of climate change, there are very few cities that will be cold enough to host the Winter Olympics down the line. So they're looking, as their climate plan, to establish a rotation of cities that could host the Winter Olympics like every 20 to 30 years. And Salt Lake is on that short list. And they love it. So what this Wait, could mean the is there? the— Who loves it? The people of Salt Lake City that aren't me and maybe 10 <laughs> listeners who email me weekly in agreement. <laughs> but what it would mean for the nation is that the U.S. could have the Olympic Games every 20 to 30 years. I don't live in Salt Lake, but that honestly sounds awesome to me. Why, why are you yeah. such a Grinch about it? OK, I'm an Olympic Grinch because 
If we remember, for example, in Beijing, just because it's cold doesn't mean that you're getting snow. So they used 50 million gallons of water to blow snow to host the Olympics. Now, anyone listening who's never even been to Salt Lake City is probably aware of the shrinking Great Salt Lake, which is our great existential climate threat here. It's kind of hilarious Given that we're most famous for not having any water, that we'd be tapped as one of 12 cities that's going to have potentially a lot of snow in 60 years. I'm not really buying it. I will say it might lead to better air quality for us because the IOC seems to be bringing a little more rigor in terms of air quality than the state of Utah itself. And it will force our state to invest in some infrastructure in Salt Lake City, which could be good for us as well. So another city that's making a big bet on the future is Madison. Bianca Martin at CityCast Madison. What What is the big gamble that your marquee university, your wonderful University of Wisconsin is making? Yes. Yeah, so... We've all been talking about, you know, beautiful things and also lots of frustrations that we encounter every day in our, our daily lives. Our city has our flagship university for the state, UW-Madison, and we have a new provost, so a new second in command, Charles Isbell, who wants Madison. Love that guy. Love that guy. Great guy. He is awesome. <laughs> we had him on the show. I highly recommend anyone listening, if you're interested, definitely go check out that conversation. He's a big thinker. He's been working on AI since, you know, the 90s. And he thinks that UW-Madison could be the epicenter of the AI revolution. And I am with him. <laughs> AI is supposed to make our lives better. Um, but we know there's a lot of biases. It follows human interactions. And we run around with a lot of stereotypes and problematic behaviors, and that gets replicated in our AI. So he wants us to be him and the entire university. The chancellor wants UW-Madison to be the epicenter of setting the human dimensions of AI and how we can keep AI human-centered. And I think we can do it. So you might not know, but UW-Madison is one of the top 10 research universities in the country. And that's because we spend like $1.5 billion in research. And I don't know, our contributions are kind of crazy. We have to brag about ourselves because I know you Coasties, like you're like, OK, UW Madison, you're cute. We've got Caltech. We've got Stanford. We've got MIT. Why, why you guys? But our contributions to our society and, and making things easier and also more efficient uh, are pretty insane. Um, we go hard on research. So we've we've changed national public policy on so many things, medicine, the way we do weather computing. So I think that we can really actually become the flagship uh, for the country if we wanted to be. Any sense of how much money or how many jobs that the university is going to bring in around AI? Yeah, so they're looking to hire and recruit 150 new faculty, and at least 50 for sure will be focused on AI. And what's dope about this is like the big bet is that UW Madison has scale. So that's what some of these other universities or some of these other colleges that really focus in on you know similar technology might not have. We've got 50,000 students and like over a thousand different programs at our university, and. That together, like they're thinking those 50 faculty will be pairing with, you know, law experts and um, educational experts. And that's what's really going to be able to make this thing glow, because we have to really find the bugs and issues in AI um, and where, you know, our biases leave us vulnerable to disaster. You know, everyone is thinking about AI's impact on ruining our lives, at least. But, you know, people like Charles Isbell knows, know the power of this technology, and they want us to be, you know, the leader there. This is Megan in Pittsburgh. Uh, Carnegie Mellon University is going to come for you. Just wait. It's coming. <laughs> I believe that. I've seen Carnegie Mellon, um, but <laughs> we could partner. Also, I wanted to say, like, for all y'all listening, uh, we do have new jobs. So come our way. Um, if you are at Carnegie Mellon, uh, UW-Madison hey. might be interested in you. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Madison out here poaching. Poaching. Madison's poaching. All day. All day. <laughs> so in Austin, one of our newest shows is in Austin, CityCast Austin. It's a different problem, Nikki Devon. It's a city that's gotten too rich to support one of its fundamental core industries. What is going on with music in the live music capital of the United States? Well, we stay calling ourselves the live music capital of the world all the time. It's everywhere, all of our stuff. But Greater Austin Music Census says that most of our musicians live at or below the poverty line. 
And those that don't live below the, below the poverty line are just moving out altogether. In addition to that, all of the cool venues around town that you used to be able to go on any night of the week and hear music are getting shut down because of the insane, insane rent. And so the city created like this thing, it's called the Live Music Fund. And they just recently like increased the grant funds to $4.5 million that can be spread out to musicians and venues. But it's not enough. If you get the grant, as a musician, you could get between fifteen and thirty thousand. If you get the grant as a venue, you can get between thirty and sixty k. But the average cost to live here in a tiny, tiny, tiny matchbox apartment is like fifteen hundred and thirty eight dollars on the low end. And then, as a venue, a friend of mine owns a venue. She says her rent is when she like if she negotiates, it's like ten k a month just to, you know, have like a little hole in the wall venue, right? So like the grants are not enough. They're not helping for long-term stuff. So it's gotten, people have had to get really creative, specifically our college age kids, because, you know, we're a big college town, UT. They've had to get creative where they hear and play music. So now they're playing music at convenience stores at night. They're playing music at dorm cafeterias. They also are playing music in drainage ditches, under Mopac, which I have to say is severely cool. It's very, very cool. I appreciate the youth and the fervor. It's very, very cool. <laughs> I'm a little too old for it, but I'm into it. So it's like the question is like, how much longer can we keep calling ourselves the live music capital of the world when we can't keep our musicians in town and we can't keep our venues open? And, you know, music is a part of like the fabric. It's a, it's a part of our identity. And it would make sense that we would come up with some sort of long-term solution. But, you know, we haven't done that yet. (laughs) We haven't done it. Grace Fuse in Nashville, I hear you bristling at the idea that Austin could consider itself the live music capital of the world. Listen, the title is up for grabs because we are struggling. We are not, we're not making good on it. We're not making good on it. Come get it. Come get it. In fact, we already have it. And actually, I've never heard of you being the music (laughs) capital, which probably means this is a one-sided rivalry. Um, you know, there's always one side that thinks that they're rivals and the other one doesn't even notice. Listen, we don't even notice we're, you. We're going to always be Austinville. Yeah, we'll That's see. what it is. That's what it is. It's always going to be we're us fight. two going fight, back fight, and fight. Oh, Here comes Listen, Vegas. This here is comes Sarah Vegas. <laughs> in Las Vegas. <laughs> Whatever. And we are coming for you. I actually just wanted to jump in that I've been seeing this alternative music venue thing happening here in the city, especially for kids that are underage. We did a whole episode about third spaces. And since then, I've seen kids playing in coffee shops at like 11 p.m. and midnight. And I think that's so brilliant for them. It's huge. And by the way, though, the cost of living here is way cheaper. So are you, you implying that we don't have kids just at better coffee move shops into our at, city. at Sorry. midnight playing music? Because you're wrong. We have punk rock. We have so much more than country, oh, Sarah. You don't know the half rock. of it. <laughs> Not out there with their acoustic right. guitar. We also okay. have Celine Dion. Okay. 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 Right. I was going to say that. <laughs> also, okay. we're in trouble. Coming back. We're in trouble, Austin. Maybe. Let's, let's, Grace, you, you can now get your, your time in the sun here. Uh, whatever you want to say. Our other new show is CityCast Nashville. And Grace Fuse, you already heard from her a little bit. But you guys <laughs> in Nashville have bet wildly, have bet ex- insane amounts of public money on a stadium what is up with that yeah so i know i know i was just fighting about us being music city but we are about to be football city which is maybe not a good thing we're getting a new stadium for i mean it depends who you ask but we're getting a new stadium for the titans that broke ground in february originally the concept here was that the new stadium was going to be a cost saving thing for taxpayers which is a brilliant rebrand basically because they were saying that nissan stadium needs renovations and originally they said that those renovations were going to cost 500 to 600 million dollars for taxpayers conveniently the titans got their own consultant who said it was actually going to be 1.7 billion dollars for the renovations which means it's so much cheaper to get a new stadium entirely which is going to be paid for by a neighborhood that doesn't exist yet which we will also be paying for uh, in the east bank development Yes, the concept is this to be cheaper to taxpayers. The concept is that this will bring new revenue, uh, supposedly like $800 million in revenue. Uh, It's going to be a dome stadium. So we're going to be like a candidate for the Super Bowl in theory, even though this is, I think, 10,000 fewer seats than the current Nissan Stadium in this new domed one. But again, in theory, we're going to have these like winter stadium tours because we know that everybody likes to schedule their stadium tours in the winter. 
There was a lot of pushback from Nashvillians, but the coverage has been so inconsistent. The numbers are inconsistent everywhere. It's very confusing. And obviously, there's this threat that the Titans will leave, which kind of overrides for some people the idea of all these taxes. Again, conveniently, the Titans' current lease runs out in 2029. So there's this push. In fact, the the Titans already left Houston. They were originally the Houston Oilers. So Bud Adams, his daughter is now the owner of the Titans. He left Houston for the similar threat of we want a new stadium and they didn't get it. Uh, Now he's trying the same thing here and it is working. So a lot of other cities are trying to make new stadiums for NBA teams, NFL teams, MLB teams, something to look out for so you don't get taken advantage of. Do, do you feel, Grace, that you are in the minority in being skeptical of this? And most people are just like, bring it. We want the Titans. We love having them here. No. Um, actually, Vanderbilt did a study that said that 56% of people think we're going in the wrong direction with this. So no, I think I'm. there's at least a slight majority. Although, again, I think people either lose track of it or care more about the Titans being here than they care about these taxes that you don't even notice are going up because it's concealed and all this other stuff. This is the billionaire stadium playbook. <laughs> Ask for a stadium, threaten to leave, get the money, and then do nothing with it. <laughs> but building an eyesore that doesn't lead to more wins. Right now, Chicago is considering a $4.2 billion plan for the Bears to get a new stadium on the lakefront, which conveniently comes after they threaten to move to Arlington Heights. And now the White Sox are doing the same thing, saying, hey, we will leave and maybe go to Nashville if y'all don't give us exactly what we want, which is more money and more land. And you know what you're going to get? The worst start in White Sox history out the gate. That's, that's the money we got. The Bears are at least saying we'll give you, you know, maybe half of the money. The White Sox said, we ain't got nothing for you. Bridget in D.C. here. Ask Ted Leonsis how that worked out here in D.C. Aren't they going to Virginia? No, no they're, we kept him. We got to, we got him to stay. And now he's on yeah, like good. the threats. The and threats now he's work. on an apology tour being like, D.C., I love you. It, it, let's get back together. <laughs> Don't fall for the mock ups. Listeners, you can't see this, but the, in the chat that's happening, everyone's comparing sort of their housing costs. And it's clear that that everyone should move to Las Vegas. <laughs> the lesson seems to be that everyone should move to Las Vegas because the housing seems to be... And I'm very... in the middle of home buying now, which is an absolute nightmare, but it's not as much as a nightmare as in all, y'all cities for sure. So let's... We're gonna, we're rounding the horn to the to the final stops in, in our CityCast uh, national tour. And I want to talk about some cities where national and local political issues are kind of cross-contaminating each other. We live in this very partisan, very divided nation. And in some of our cities, local issues are becoming infected by national divisions. And other cities, national divisions are trickling into cities and fomenting local conflicts that hadn't existed before. So I want to start in Houston. Raheel Ramzanali, how is Texas's very red state government preventing your very blue city of Houston from carrying out its own policies. Yeah. So since last June, Harris County in the Houston area has been trying to launch a pilot for a guaranteed income program. It's designed to give $500 a month to about 1,900 families for a year and a half using funds from the American Rescue Plan. So not even funds from the state level. This type of assistance program aims to lift low-income families out of poverty. And a lot of cities across the nation and even in Texas are leading the way. But in Houston, The pilot is getting caught up in this red state, blue city politics that shapes so much of local government in Texas these days. Just a few weeks ago, the Texas Supreme Court put the pilot on hold because a pending lawsuit led by state attorney general Ken Paxton, remember that name, says it's unconstitutional. So the Houston area residents who were chosen by a lottery system are still waiting for their first payment. Austin and San Antonio, they have similar programs. They've executed those programs already. But in Houston, it's being held hostage because the red state government won't let a blue city experiment with a social impact program using funds from the American Rescue Plan. Now, why does this matter to everyone listening? Well, some people think it could set a precedent to target other guaranteed income programs throughout the country, especially if former President Trump were to win the presidency in November because he's already floated the idea of Ken Paxton as a candidate for U.S. Attorney General. Oh, my goodness. Is the Guaranteed Income Program popular in Houston? I assume it is. I assume people are excited to test it. Yeah, everyone was excited about this when it was launched. There was 
so many applicants for it. Unfortunately, you you don't want that many because it's people living below the median income, right? You don't want that many applicants, but everyone's excited. We were all excited to see the results from this. Can you roll this out on a bigger stage in the city of Houston? How would this help families uh, escape poverty? And now we, we don't know. We don't know if we're able to find out. Lindsay Van Allen, you live in Boise, which like Houston is a relatively blue uh, city in a very red state. And you're beginning to have a, a burgeoning health care crisis in in Idaho because of the abortion policies in the state, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Idaho is losing doctors in this post row world. And really, it could have implications for everyone. So just a little history, Roe v. Wade fell two years ago. And since then, Idaho has instituted one of the strictest abortion bans in the country, and it has no exceptions for health of the pregnant person or health of the mother. So if you want to really see how bad can it get in a post-Roe world, just take a look at Idaho. Our maternal mortality rate has more than doubled, and almost one in four OBGYNs has left the state since the Dobbs decision. That's an incredible stat. Do you know how many that is? How many how many OBGYNs there are in Idaho? Yes, yeah, so left? we started with approximately 221. We're down to about 175 as of the time of that study, and that was more than six months ago. So it's just getting worse. And we already had one of the worst doctor to patient ratios in the entire country. And are women seeing impacts on their health that you can tell already? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We have had three healthcare centers completely stop providing OBGYN care. So Bonner Health in Sandpoint, Idaho, Valor Health in Emmett, and West Valley Medical Center in Caldwell. So women and pregnant people are having to drive almost an hour to get healthcare. And as someone who used to work in healthcare, if you have a pregnancy emergency, if you have a labor emergency, seconds count. And so if you're having to drive 45 minutes, 50 minutes, where your local hospital was only five or 10 minutes away, that can be a life or death difference. And is that affecting you in Boise as well? Or is this mostly affecting the the more rural areas of the state? Oh, it absolutely is affecting Boise because Boise is kind of the hub of healthcare in the state. And so if something's going wrong, patients will come to Boise. And from Boise, a lot of them are having to be life flighted to states like Utah, which has significantly better healthcare when it comes to abortion than Idaho does. The amount of emergency life flights that pregnant people have needed in the past year has gone up six times. Wow. So we have reached the end of our journey, and we're now in downtown Denver hanging out with Bree Davies. Bree, how is some hateful anti-LGBTQ <laughs> rhetoric splitting the Colorado Republican Party? Uh, I know. I feel like I have the most epic bummer uh, topic here, but I, I will say just to preface this, Colorado is, is pretty progressive, right? We're known for having weed legal for a decade. We decriminalize magic mushrooms. Our gay governor has consistently worked to enshrine abortion access in our state constitution. Um, it's something that it's just a given here, but we still have this very prominent GOP. And in June, which is Pride Month, as everyone knows, the Colorado, the chairman of the Colorado GOP, Dave, let's go Brandon Williams, just to let you all know, uh, this is a man that tried to sue the secretary of state for not letting him put Dave, let's go Brandon Williams on the ballot. Wait, oh, when he oh my God. That was, I thought that was just yeah. a, some kind of like joke you were making about how right wing he was. No, he literally calls nope. himself. Let's go, Brandon. He calls himself Dave. Let's go, Brandon oh Williams and wanted people to vote for him as such. But he uh, during June, he sent out this email under the guise of the G Colorado GOP. He's the chairman saying that the LGBTQ community were, quote, godless groomers in our society. And the email included an image of Jesus with laser eyes that said, quote, God hates flags. So. Someone giving a big wink to the Westboro Baptist Church and their famous homophobic slogan, which I will not repeat here. But the email just caused sort of a big stir within the political party itself. And it's just part of this growing divide that we're seeing between sort of the MAGA Republicans and these more old school conservative Republicans. And I will just say we have a really interesting more conservative base here, especially in rural areas where these guys are almost libertarian leaning and that like some of them support abortion. 
for instance, because it's a cost saving measure. Um, so this sort of side of the, the MAGA side has just really come out really strong. I think most folks will know across the country, a congresswoman from here, Lauren Boebert, and um, she's part of this MAGA faithful. And But this particular move by Dave Williams really pushed, I think, the, the old school side to their limit. So they were finally like, okay, the, uh, not, literally enough is enough. And so there have been some calls from within the, the more conservative side of the GOP to have Dave Williams removed from his position. There was another higher up in the GOP who was trying to collect signatures to get him removed. And then she was censured. So it's still this fight back and forth between the MAGA GOP and the conservative GOP. And I think that it obviously has bigger implications for what's happening around the country. But it's just something that I think a lot of folks don't know about Colorado is just as much as we're a progressive stronghold, we have a very interesting dichotomy within our own GOP. I think so many of our, now that I'm thinking about this, so many of the states that CityCast is in, we have these this these extremely progressive cities where we have podcasts and newsletters, and then you have countrysides, you have rural and suburban and exurban areas that are so much more conservative. And that conflict is sort of the fun. It's one of the fundamental conflicts of the country right now. Is that is just that conflict? I mean, we've just heard about it in Boise, and it's true in Madison. It's true. Uh, it's true to a certain extent in Pennsylvania. I mean, it's it's really astonishing. Yeah. And I think that um, we just make a some, I, I, at least for me, doing the reporting that we've done on the special series on Lauren Boebert, I've gotten to know and understand the GOP a little bit better here. And like I said, there there are some um, folks within rural areas that are actually more progressive than people think that still lean in the conservative side. But this particular issue has really brought that to light because a lot of folks within the GOP are actually rejecting their own party's endorsement because they feel strongly that LGBTQ people should be able to be included in the Republican Party. Y'all, it has been such a treat. I, I was very anxious about this experiment. I didn't know how it was going to go, but you all have been so delightful. What you're engaged in is so interesting. And and I would say to to anyone who's listening to this, like if you have friends who live in one of these other cities who live in who a friend who lives in Boise, a friend who lives in Pittsburgh, a friend who lives in in Chicago, who isn't listening to a city cast in that city, let them know because don't you want it to hear from these wonderful hosts? So thank you all for being such good sports here. You're thank welcome. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, everybody. Thanks, David. And I gotta get this in here. Go birds. I'm sorry, Nashville. I, I, you can't. You was talking about that. Oh my goodness. Stuff. Trinae cannot literally, Trinae literally, Trinae literally cannot get through a podcast without hyping the Eagles. I mean, you need a blooper. It's fine. Thank you all for joining us on CityCast USA and hearing about some local issues that may be what your city is talking about in a few months or a few years. We'll be back on Friday after the holiday with a regular episode of your CityCast. Cast.